So thanks a lot for for uh, for the, the invitation. Thanks, um, Valentina, for the kind introduction. Um, the paper I'm presenting uh, now is uh, joint with uh, Gabriele Cristelli. Actually, it's one of the chapter uh, of um, his dissertation uh, while uh, it was at uh, of his PhD dissertation at uh, the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne. Now Gabriele is a postdoc at Stanford University. Um, and um, this paper presently under revision in a journal. Uh, so um, in a nutshell, our paper is about uh, the innovation effect uh, of a major uh, policy shock uh, in uh, Switzerland, which was the signing of the agreement of the free movement of people with the European Union in 1999. And this was, as I say, a major labor supply shock because uh, it, it greatly increased uh, the inflow of highly skilled um, uh, work. Well, it increased the increase of many types of workers, but it ended up, it showed up uh, after a few years of observation that uh, the category that was most affected, uh, that benefited the most uh, in terms of relative increase in size, was that of high skilled workers, including. Uh, uh, STEM professionals, including uh, inventors, which is a particular category of STEM professionals. And uh, one of the studies that uh, highlighted um, this uh, effect of uh, the FMP, that is great impact, in particular, great impact for the inflow of high skilled workers, was a paper published in an economic review by Barely, Perry, and others. Uh, um, that exploit uh, uh, regional differences in the implementation of the treaty uh, as a way of uh, quasi-natural experiment. What we do, we reprint, we, we start from the same type of natural experiment with some nuances, but we apply it um, not for all workers, uh, and we do not content ourselves to say that the highly skilled workers benefited more than less skilled workers, but we go into detail and we try to show that this inflow of skilled workers is valid only also for a specific category of these skilled workers, inventors, and it produces an increase in the number of patents uh, thanks to these uh, inventors arriving. Um, so uh, we do it uh, with uh, two types of exercises. One is a uh, Different, different, uh, different, different estimation of the quantitative input by region. So we do an, uh, some analysis at the regional level. We compare the regions that uh, receive the treatment that is implemented the treaty before than others. And we show that uh, there the number of patent increases, plus a few other things that we show you. And then we go more into depth and we look at the effect uh, at a level of individual inventor. That is, we try to understand how individual Swiss inventors already residing in Switzerland were affected by the arrival of these uh, foreign inventors from uh, especially the bordering countries. And uh, we, again, in a nutshell, uh, we try to show that uh, the productivity of, in, of the Swiss inventors increased thanks to the, to the arrival of the foreign inventors. Uh, in particular, we find that the magnitude of the effect when measured at the regional level is pretty high. Uh, that is estimates based on our parameters suggest 24% uh, more patents in eight years. We don't find, however, any effect on the quality of patents. That is, we don't find that the patents of Switzerland increase in quality, they are more inventive, more innovative, simply, increase in the amount of uh, innovation, inventive output, uh, and uh, that uh, um, not only foreign inventors were not displaced, but actually they increased their productivity thanks to the arrival of the foreign inventors. However, this uh, increase in productivity is not due to any knowledge spillover effect. So we don't see uh, that uh, for, uh, Swiss inventors learn anything relevant for uh, from foreign inventors, also due to the demographic characteristic of these foreign inventors on which we spend a few words, but simply because these foreign inventors allow to build uh, a higher number of teams 
larger teams of inventors, and they come with some distinctive input. When you look at the sources of invention uh, on by teams, including uh, foreign inventors, you see some uh, some sources that don't appear on uh, patents by by native inventors. However, when native inventors invent alone, they don't cite this this foreign this foreign literature. So, uh, just to justify putting in context and justify our study. Um, we try to fill a certain number of gaps in the literature. There is an increasing consensus on the existence of a causal link that goes from immigration to innovation. But uh, most of this evidence has been produced for the United States uh, that uh, at the same time are the biggest receiver of foreign talent. Uh, and they have a number of uh, uh, policy historical shocks uh, that have lent themselves to produce this type of research. So for example, uh, the visa through which uh, many foreign uh, researchers uh, enter or stay in the United States is the H-1B visa. Luckily for the researcher uh, on in the U.S., uh, uh, for political reasons that have nothing to do with uh, innovation, this type of visa has been subject to a, a large number of random variation, which allow to, to study the effect of this variation on the inflow of foreign inventors and their impact. Uh, there are a number of historical episodes in the 19th century, in the 20th century, uh, having to do with the inflow of different uh, uh, highly skilled people pushed out of their country, like uh, Jewish uh, scientists, like uh, post-Soviet scientists, uh, which again lend themselves to, to this type of study. In Europe, we have a number of studies, especially at the level of geographical variation of innovation activity based on the presence of uh, foreign talent. Uh, but they don't have the same strong uh, identification uh, uh, strategy. Uh, so our study, in a sense, tries to uh, replicate the same type of uh, strong uh, causal analysis that uh, we have for the United States and is lacking for Europe at the level of innovation migration. Uh, the, at the conceptual level, uh, still uh, uh, is not clear what is the contribution uh, of uh, um, highly skilled migrants, in particular STEM migrants, inventor scientists, uh, to innovation in the destination countries. Uh, uh, some of the evidence, for example, um, produced by studies on the historical immigration shocks to the United States, uh, the German uh, Jews uh, scientists, uh, the uh, post-Soviet Soviet, Soviet scientists, um, show that these people transmitted the knowledge that was absent before their arrival or was not as diffused in the United States before their arrival. However, um, first, uh, this has not always been historically the case. If one is knowledgeable about uh, modern pre-industrial revolution history in Europe, there has been for a long while uh, tradition of itinerant craftsmen and entrepreneur that uh, uh, carried their knowledge with them, but they never spread it. And uh, in any case, uh, the most important migration flow of STEM professionals uh, today do not concern uh, senior people. They concern uh, junior people, students, postdoc. And uh, it is legitimate to suspect that while this person may bring in peculiar skills, uh, skills that may be lacking in the, in the country of destination, they may not have uh, a senior knowledge to transfer to uh, uh, juniors uh, in the destination country, so that is, they cannot raise generation of new organic chem uh, chemists uh, like uh, the German scientists did in the 1930s or the Soviet scientists did with math uh, in the 1990s. So they are junior people, and and they may even learn a lot of the the knowledge that they used to invent in the destination country. Uh, so we would like to check what is the balance in a place like Switzerland. Second, um, one issue that has not been uh, very much explored within the field of immigration and, uh, and innovation is that a lot of uh, innovation to the existence of strong complementarities between uh, inventors, native and foreigners. Uh, a bit much uh, like you find in the general literature on labor, in which you find that uh, um, some of the productivity gains due to the arrival of migrants is related to 
a, uh, the possibility they offer for a final division of labor between natives and migrants uh, with the different specialization taken by one and the other. So again, knowledge is a, in a sense is a pro product like many others. Can teamwork, can the possibilities that uh, uh, an inflow of uh, young uh, uh, STEM R&D oriented professional can increase simply productivity of R&D teams through these metrics. So why Switzerland? Why should you be interested here? Should you stay here listening to Switzerland uh, about Switzerland from me today? Small country, why? Well, because if you do innovation, Switzerland is a fantastic case study. It is the top one country in the world for uh, uh, the ratio of patents over population and is in the top 12 or 10 for the ratio between R&D worker and population of working age. Yeah, hugely highly intensive uh, uh, R&D countries. Uh, and it's also a prominent migration hub for STEM workers. Um, there is a special category of patents, which is uh, pretty tiny, that until 2010 reported the nationality of inventors. In Switzerland, 38% of inventors reported on the specific, specific, special type of patents were foreign nationals against uh, in the UK, 12% or 16% in the United States. And when you look at uh, the nationality of uh, a STEM professor, art science engineering professor in the United States, uh, you still are uh, in between one quarter and 40%. So big migration hub, big hub also for a migration of international students. So uh, it's interesting per se. Uh, it is uh, possibly also representative for similar countries in Europe that you don't have in North America, which are countries like Switzerland of medium, small sites, very much R&D intensive uh, and uh, um, surrounded by countries that relative to them uh, can offer a strong supply of uh, uh, STEM research, STEM workers, like uh, Belgium, like the Netherlands, they all have big neighbors like Germany, Italy, like France, uh, that uh, uh, produce many, many STEM uh, graduates. Uh, and at the same time, they offer uh, an interesting working condition for these STEM graduates. Actually, anticipate but you may know better than me, the, big, uh, the biggest inflow of, uh, uh, actually, biggest outflow of German STEM graduates uh, don't go to the United States, it's Switzerland. It's Switzerland, in absolute terms, beat the United States in terms of number of German uh, R&D graduates, uh, STEM graduates, etc. Last, uh, Switzerland is interesting because the policy shock we study is uh, uh, based, is an extension to Switzerland of the free movement principle, which is a pillar of the European Union uh, uh, migration policy. Something that people tend to forget, uh, a lot of migration in Europe is within Europe. Uh, and you live in a country that uh, gave away the free movement principle. So I bet that in the future, there will be many studies on the negative effects that these may have engendered on the R&D system of uh, the UK. We are doing an effect, a study on the possible pot potential positive effect uh, that joining uh, uh, the free movement uh, principle has had for Switzerland. So, um, okay. I will have to spend before plunging into the results of our research, you will need to be patient because uh, the database building behind this work is pretty complex. I need to take some time to explain how we build our data. Then we move to the analysis. So uh, we focus on a particular category of workers, uh, of migrants, sorry, that are the so-called cross-border workers. They are permit G holders. They are daily and weekly commuters from uh, some areas designed, designated by the Swiss law in uh, Italy, Northern Italy in particular, north of Milan, uh, in uh, bordering regions of uh, uh, other countries, such as Alsatia, uh, Baden, Southern Baden-Württemberg, uh, Western Bavaria, uh, Western uh, Austria, from which uh, um, whose residents are allowed to come to work to Switzerland uh, with this particular permit order. They are distinct uh, from uh, resident immigrants or that for our purpose are holders of any other type of permit and whose address is in Switzerland, whose home address is in Switzerland. Why do we focus on this uh, peculiar type of immigrants? 
because uh, they are those that uh, were affected by the early stage implementation of the AFMP treaty, the Treaty on the Free Movement of People. In between when the, treatment, uh, the treaty was signed in 1999 and 2007, they were the only category of immigrants from Europe for which there was a liberalization. And this is important because uh, these uh, cross-border workers were admitted not all over uh, Switzerland. They were admitted for all the time period of our interest only in selected regions within Switzerland. So basically by focusing on them, we can focus uh, on uh, different uh, group of regions, some for which uh, the treaty didn't uh, produce any result until 2007 because they couldn't host this type of uh, cross-border workers and the regions that uh, started being affected uh, from day one of the treaty signature, that are the regions, the border regions of Switzerland, the regions of Switzerland closer to the borders with the regions from where these uh, cross-border workers come, for, for which uh, the treaty uh, started producing effect from day one. And so we can compare the difference in difference approach uh, the impact of the treaty on the treated and the non-treated regions. Within the treated regions, we can split further, and this is our main focus, between, let's say, heavily treated regions, that are the regions at a short commuting distance from the border, and the other regions. Why? Because even though border regions were all in principle open to cross-border workers, these cross-border workers have an extraordinarily higher preference for not moving more than 20 minutes into Switzerland uh, um, territory for picking a job. They are highly concentrated at very short commuting distance from the, from the border. So we can split basically the border regions in those that in principle could receive cross-border workers, but they don't receive them, and those that receive them. Why do we prefer to compare two different types of border regions rather than border and non-border regions? It's because the non-border regions are on the inside of Switzerland. They are mostly agricultural regions, touristic regions. They don't have R&D. While uh, the regions closer to the border are uh, the host of most R&D activity in Switzerland. But for example, you can compare a city like Zurich, which is farther a bit uh, more remote from the border and doesn't receive many foreign, uh, many cross-border workers, many, many daily commuters from outside Switzerland, with Basel, which is also a big R&D hub, and it's a few meters away from the border uh, with Germany and the border of France. You can compare uh, um, cities uh, more on the inside of Switzerland uh, with uh, Geneva, that is at the border with France. So basically, the exercise we do, uh, we split, we divide the uh, um, so-called uh, mobilité spatiale region that are, let's say, uh, commuter work, uh, uh, travel work, travel to work areas inside Switzerland in three groups. In gray, you have the non-border regions where the cross-border workers are not admitted to the yellow regions where they are admitted, but they don't go often. They prefer not to go. And the pink ones, which are the real destination, the real host of cross-border work. And why we can do that? Because uh, uh, cross-border workers uh, were, uh, until 99, subject to a number of restrictions. Uh, there were quotas. There was uh, the need for their employer to prove uh, to have the first uh, host uh, unsuccessfully sought after a native for that type of job. Um, the admission procedure was very complex. The visa was lost the moment uh, the job was lost. Uh, and uh, the residents in the country of origin, the designated border areas of Germany, Austria, had to be there for more than six months. Uh, at the beginning, uh, commuting had to be daily. Uh, the, the older of a permit like this could not sleep in Switzerland, uh, and so on and so forth. 
But uh, during the uh, years from two, 1999 to 2007, this category of uh, cross-border workers uh, start getting an easier and easier life. First, uh, all the bureaucratic procedures for getting uh, a visa are scrapped, no need to prove for the employer that uh, they sought after a native. Uh, commuting can become weekly uh, and the work permission outlast the first job up to five years. So we have a, a time frame in which some regions, the regions that receive cross-border workers, see a liberalization of entry, while all the other regions don't see this liberalization of entry. And so we can compare the trends in um, patenting of regions or native inventors resident in those regions uh, to those in the non-treated regions. So what data do we use? We use patent data. These are our main source. Patent data have information on both the inventions that are protected by the patent and some biographical information on the inventors that we exploit. Name, the surname, and the address of these inventors. So we have solved a number of technical issues before we can use this data. So basically the three issues we know the address of the company that owned the patent. We know the address of the inventors who signed the patent. We need to use this information to geolocate the R&D lab in a treated or non-treated region, which is a very complicated exercise because as you have seen in this figure, some of these regions can be really tiny and just um, making a mistake of a few kilometers and misattribute the R&D location of uh, uh, the location of a lab into a treated or non-treated region. Second, we must identify which inventors on patents are Swiss residents, possibly distinguishing between Swiss nationals and foreign nationals resident in Switzerland, from the category of inventors to whom we are interested, which we will call the cross-border inventors, the inventors who commute from Germany, from France, from Italy to Switzerland to do their uh, R&D. And uh, so what do we do? We exploit uh, mostly the inventor address because the applicant address of patent can be tricky. In many cases, uh, uh, patent, uh, uh, the companies that own the patent don't put the address of the laboratory where the patent was invented, but their headquarters. Huh? I've checked. Uh, one of the biggest R&D labs in Southampton is the British American Tobacco Company. They have uh, their uh, R&D headquarters in Southampton, but the um, financial headquarters are in London. If you look at their patents, they are assigned to London. So if I try to look at the applicant address, they would tell me that uh, all the inventions of British American Tobacco in the UK are done in London, but they are not done in London. They are done in Southampton. When you look at the address of the inventors that work for a British American tobacco, you notice that they all live in Southampton. And so we discover the existence of the Southampton laboratory by testing the frequency of distribution across regions of the inventors on the British American tobacco patents. We see that uh, most of them are in Southampton. We decide that the laboratory must be there because it's where I see the uh, agglomeration of all the inventors uh, based on their home address uh, of patents or British American tobacco. Or uh, if you want to take a German a Swiss example, the most important uh, R&D laboratory in Europe uh, for Switzerland for IBM is in Zurich. If you look at uh, the patent coming uh, from uh, Swiss inventors, inventor with a Swiss address, uh, they are all reported as property of IBM US in New Jersey. But if you look at the inventor address, it's Zurich. So we discovered that there is in Zurich and Gerlichkan, uh, in particular in Rüschlikon, a, a laboratory because we see that the density is there. So basically we do a map of all the R&D labs in Switzerland, region by region, based on where there is the majority of the inventors uh, residing around that city at company by company. Um, um, sorry, Francesco, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so basically you do this exercise only like relying on the address of the Swiss inventors, right? Because no, if... uh, yes, or the Swiss inventors, sure, sure. Because if you, okay, 
Thank you. What we do, however, we sample also the foreign inventors in this way. Basically, first, uh, we take uh, uh, all the inventors in uh, EPOPATSTAT, that is um, the European Patents Office patent. We disambiguate them because we need to distinguish between uh, Francesco Lissoni on two different patents. We need to know whether Francesco Lissoni on two different patents is the same person or two homonyms. So we treat the data with an algorithm to try to assign a unique ID to each inventor. And then we do a double sampling. First, we sample all the Swiss resident or the patent by Swiss resident inventors. We check the address. All the patents on which there is a Swiss resident inventor is part of our initial sample. Plus, we add all the patents in which there is any inventor from a designated area, so from a potential sourcing area of commuting workers, but a Swiss applicant, a company that we know to be Swiss. Okay, as they are Brown Boveri, Novartis, uh, and so on and so forth. Then, uh, with the technique I told you, we assign each patent to a presumed R&D location. So we know where the patent was originated in a treated or non-treated region. And uh, we throw away patent that may have been done in Baden-Württemberg, uh, but uh, by workers that live there and don't come to work in Switzerland because we realize the patent is not really Swiss. And we remain with 62,000 patents, uh, 12,000 applicants, that is prop owner of the patent, and 36,000 in them. And 106 regions non-empty, which we are sure there is at least one R&D lab. Um, I have another question. Yeah. So if you have a patent that uh, does not have Swiss inventors, how do you design like the R&D lab? If, if, the, if the patent has zero Swiss inventors, we cannot catch it because it's impossible for us to assign it to, to Switzerland. It could be it could be dangerous. Imagine that uh, that uh, Novartis was headquarters in in. Uh, in uh, in uh, Basel as an R&D lab also in Germany. If there is no Swiss inventor, we cannot say whether the patent is done by a German R&D lab uh, with German workers, uh, and it would be a problem attributing it to Switzerland, because we want to make sure that uh, the patent has been originated in Switzerland and all the R&D workers in the lab uh, are subject to the type of legislation we want to study. We consider, and I can later, also all the R&D activity done in the regions around in Switzerland to test whether there is brain drain or not. I will come back uh, to it um, in a second. Okay? Thank you. So basically, now we need to identify who are the cross-border workers on, on the patents. And basically, our definition is the following. For all the patents for which we are sure the R&D lab is in Switzerland, our cross-border inventors are those with a foreign address in one of the regions from which you can get a cross-border worker permit. Okay, If I have an American inventor with an address in New Jersey, this is not a cross-border inventor. This is a foreign inventor collaborating from the United States with Switzerland. But if I have a, a, an inventor with an address in Mulhouse or uh, in Como, in, or uh, in uh, Evian, uh, just across the border. For us, this person is a cross-border worker who go from Evian to Lausanne, from Mulhouse to Basel, from Como to Lugano, every day to invent, to do his work as an inventor. Um, as opposed to the cross-border inventors, we have the resident inventors. We cannot distinguish based only on the address between foreign resident and Swiss resident. Also because many of them are German, they have the same name or surname, so not even name analysis would help. Uh, so basically our two type of inventors are resident inventors and cross-border inventors. However, the large majority of uh, resident inventors are also Swiss nationals. We validate this, uh, our um, attribution by having access to a very unique database that originally we wanted to use for the entire data set, but it doesn't cover enough years, which is uh, the archives of all the um, visa holder of Switzerland starting 2002. So we have the name and surname and address and company of all the holders of uh, a, a visa for foreigners in, the, in Switzerland from 2002. 
So we can match all the inventors by name and address uh, to all the visa holders of Switzerland starting 2002. And for those years, we can check whether our patent-based definition and the real definition, the visa definition, match. And uh, I won't go into details. I will show you just a graph at some point. Uh, we have a 95, 98% match. So we get it right. We are confident we are getting that. Just to give you an idea, based on uh, patent addresses, this is the residence of our cross-border inventors around, around Switzerland. So you see, you have just a few here in Northern Italy. You have many around Geneva and Lausanne. You have very many around Basel and all over Schaffhausen, which are the strongholds of Switzerland R&D, plus some also here in Austria. They all live very close to the border. This is the first graph that uh, gives you a lot of uh, information about uh, both our database building and our key result. So we are already plunging into the results, but at the same time, I want to give you some more information on these cross-border inventors. This is the number of cross-border inventors we identify with our technique over time in three groups of Swiss regions. The non-border regions, that is the regions that are not supposed to host any cross-border worker, at least until 2007. The regions uh, that are uh, in which cross-border workers are admitted, but they are farther than 20 minutes from dry, uh, driving from the border. And the border regions very close to the border at less than 20 minutes drive. And what you see is that uh, quite correctly, we get zero until 2007 cross-border inventors in the regions in which they were not supposed to enter. We have uh, a certain steady trend of entry of um, cross-border uh, inventors uh, in the regions a bit farther, farther from uh, the frontier. And in the regions where we suspect to find most of them, we have a parallel trend up until 1999. And then it shoot up the number and stabilizes again uh, around 2005, and it remains so after. The dots that you see are the same estimates made with the uh, register migration register data. So these uh, the lines are our estimate based on patent information, the address. These are people we get by looking at their type of visa. And we get it pretty much right. Uh, so we are confident that even our analysis before 2002, when we don't have the archival data, the register data are based just on the patent information, we are pretty confident we are getting it right even before. That's our main point of defense of our, our application, our data building. Before we move to the econometric result, uh, some characteristics of these inventors, which are very important. These cross-border inventors are junior people. They are not senior inventors that move from Germany, they get a job and start community. How do we see it? We see it in two ways. Uh, when we look just at patenting activity, most of them don't have uh, a patent before coming to Switzerland. Their first patent uh, is in Switzerland, okay? Only 10% of them have uh, a first a patent before coming to Switzerland. And uh, over uh, half uh, of them patent again in Switzerland, not abroad. So they are not coming to Switzerland uh, temporarily. They do not have uh, just a collaboration as a senior people with Switzerland. They have, tend to be rather junior people coming to Switzerland and becoming inventors in Switzerland. When we look uh, at the for those that arrived after 2002, for which we have a lot of uh, um, personal information, we know that they arrive more or less at uh, age 30. Age 30, as you can see in this graph, uh, age 30 is important because other studies uh, show that it's the median age in which inventors usually file their first patent. So again, these are people who may not have, uh, this is also important for brain drain issues, these people may have not may have not had been inventors if they stayed home, if they didn't have the possibility to work in Switzerland. They come to Switzerland and they become inventors in Switzerland. 
These has two consequences. First, uh, as we will see, they work mostly in teams. They are the junior researchers of teams. They are not the leaders of the teams. They don't come with a big budget, baggage of knowledge to transfer from their country to Switzerland. Their importance is that they are skilled people, that they are uh, filling uh, a skill gap that clearly existed due to constraint of high-skilled immigration in Switzerland. Uh, okay, first uh, type of analysis is regional analysis. So our observations are these uh, to work uh, regions, um, which we put M here, observed at each point in time here. So we have an innovation outcome. We come back to the, what is our innovation outcome, which is basically equal uh, to the um, uh, a series of fixed effects at the regional level, at the year level, at, at the classic, classic interaction uh, 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 variable in which uh, we have uh, a, a, a dummy for the year and uh, uh, a dummy for whether the uh, region uh, belongs to the treated group or the non-treated group. Uh, are uh, border regions more remote from the border. For uh, robustness check, we also do the same analysis in which one is all the border regions and uh, the non-border regions is zero, and we get very similar results. So um, we do estimation by Poisson maximum, uh, maximum likelihood, and of course the parameters of interest are this beta. Okay, we want to we expect that these beta estimates to be zero before the shock, and to have uh, some positive values or some zero values when we observe something else, some different values uh, after the shock. So here, I will only report you the uh, beta estimates uh, in different graphs. So the first innovation outcome I want to show you is the regional patent output. The number of output, the patents filed in each year from R&D in the different regions. And what we see that before the shock, uh, the beta estimate is zero. It means that uh, the difference in difference between treated and non-treated region is zero. What happened after the shock is that I get uh, some beta estimate positive. It means, as it's shown in this graph, that uh, not only the number of inventors, but the number of, of foreign inventors, but the number of uh, total patents filed uh, in the treated regions increases much faster in these years from 2000 to around 2006 in the treated regions and then, then in the non-treated regions. In the regions for which we have seen this boom in the arrival of foreign inventors start patenting much more relative to the non-treated regions. Um, we, may, um, we may suspect that this effect is due to some Swiss companies moving to the treated regions in order to profit from the new supply of cross-border inventors. So we restrict our analysis to incumbent applicants, that is companies that were already established with their R&D labs in the treated regions before the opening of Switzerland, and we still get the same result. We can say the result is not due to a change in the composition of companies in Swiss regions, it's the incumbent region companies that were already in their locations that uh, profit of the inflow of uh, cross-border inventors. We also check whether this effect was not due to top applicants. What do we mean by top applicants? Meaning the applicants that are in terms of patent portfolio in the 99.9th percentiles, the real top, we are thinking Novartis, Azea Brown Bovary, um, real colossus of R&D that alone and full of companies are making 30% of the patents in Switzerland. Why we remove them from our sample? Because they were the hard lobbyist for the signing of the treaty. So you could presume that they anticipated somehow the, the outcome of the political process. But even when we remove them, we still observe some significant effect of our work of our short. 
Now, going to what is more in the direction of what is the contribution of these cross-border inventors, we also make split estimates for two different types of patents. This is a subtle point. Patents are made by teams. So me and Valentina, we work on a patent together. We are a team. I can split uh, these patents by the patents made by team that host at least uh, one cross-border inventor. And uh, patents whose team of inventor include only a resident. The second category of patent is in gray. The patents that host uh, a cross-border inventors are in black. What is the category of patent that see a boost after the arrival of the cross-border inventors? Only the patents that include directly one of these cross-border inventors in the team. Why is this relevant? Because it tells us that there are not, at least uh, in the limited amount of time, we observe a lot of spillovers. If you want to profit, teams that do not host them. So their contribution is very much not related to knowledge diffusion, but to direct input to the innovative process. Clearly, if we observe uh, that the arrival of foreign inventors correspond to an increase in total patenting, we may already suspect uh, that the displacement uh, has not taken place, but we want to make sure. So we redo the same type of regression where the innovation output here is uh, the number of active resident inventors in each region. And we see that this does not decrease. So we have beta is always beta is always zero before the shock. It is still zero later. It's even slightly positive. There is actually a positive and inclusion effect. Uh, uh, instead of a displacement, uh, uh, there is an increase in the number of native inventors in, uh, in Switzerland. So we may also fear that this boom of inventive activity in Switzerland has occurred simply by transferring brains from outside Switzerland into Switzerland. We suspect not for the reason I told you before, because many of these cross-border inventors arrive at age 30. They arrive with no patents done in their country of origin. It is likely that if they stayed in Germany, if they stayed in France, they would have been engineers at the production level, maybe. Uh, they would have been uh, university professors, maybe, but they would have not been inventors. They become inventors because they, because they have the opportunity to do so in Switzerland. And actually, when we redo the type of regional uh, analysis, not for Swiss regions, but for um, Nats three regions, uh, outside Switzerland, in the countries around Switzerland, that is Austria, Germany, France, and Italy. And we do the same type of difference in different analysis. We take uh, color here are the regions from where the, the cross-border inventors may come. The non-colored regions are all the other regions in the country. When we do the analysis, uh, we don't find uh, any effect. So this is, for example, France and Germany. Is a difference in different analysis between the treated regions, that is the regions from which cross-border workers come, compared to the other regions in France, compared to the other regions in Germany, and we don't see any negative effect of the treaty on the uh, amount of patents filed each year in this region. So the conclusion at this point from this part of the analysis is that this is a win-win situation, or at least no loss situation. It's not. Uh, there's no brain drain. Uh, I move quickly to the last point. Yes, please. I see. So, a quick question: Is it possible that actually people move to those bordering regions? Yeah, that's, to that's... have access. So, what when you're looking at the brain drain and finding no effect? Well, it's not surprising, right? Because people have actually relocated to be near. Switzerland and those bordering regions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, in a, there is this is actually the core of a, a, the, another chapter of the my, st my student dissertation, uh, a paper with uh, Rainer Widman of Max Planck. They look uh, more deeply into the effects um, of uh, the 
the treaty in the regions of origin. They see that um, basically uh, over 50% of the inventors uh, that get this type of um, permit uh, were born in the regions where they live. And they don't see a great change in the composition around the years uh, for which we do our study. I don't know whether I answered your question. So basically, most of these uh, inventors coming from Baden-Württemberg or, or Alsatia, Mulhouse, are born there, were born there, and there is not such a big change in the years that follow. So we don't presume that a lot of this effect is due to a, a, a sequence of uh, a chain of movements that is, uh, People move from Baden-Württemberg into Switzerland in terms of job, jobs, and they are replaced by people moving from Hamburg to, to Baden-Württemberg. Okay, thank you. Still, still, still uh, Jackie, still what would happen, uh, and that actually was a comment that was made to us by the Germans, is that the brain drain may be felt in other, uh, for other type of jobs. So if my, if my best production engineers become inventors in Switzerland, I may suffer a loss in the at the at the production on the on the shop floor i don't have the engineering for production the, yeah I, and i guess if somebody is not very generous who well, you know saying that 50 percent were born there this yeah. also means that 50 percent moved yeah so yeah, it depends but, but, yeah yeah the percentage don't 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 change much during our shock time so we don't yeah. we've be, been a big replacement effect that driven by this this change uh, st uh, to be honest, uh, uh, some effect may be seen for Italy, not by us, but others also have found it for Italy. But that may be related to problems of its own that Italy has uh, <laughs> that coincide uh, time-wise. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, you, you, so, okay, so, this, is, this is not Germany. So, but still, uh, we are, this is our result. So at the individual level, uh, we split inventors into two categories, incumbent inventors, entrant inventors. Incumbent inventors are the only one for which we can have a solid uh, identification strategy. They are resident inventors in Switzerland with at least one patent before the shock, before the policy shock. So they were already active as inventors and they were already located in the region, uh, in Switzerland before the shock. We keep them located uh, artificially in the country of origin, in the region of uh, in the region in which they started their patenting activity because we want to observe uh, uh, them as being affected by their position when the shock arrived. So we asked two questions. One is, what is the productivity effect? Did these incumbent inventors increase or decrease their productivity due to the arrival of the foreign inventors? And uh, if they increased it, as we find, does this depend on the fact that they were uh, open to the possibility to collaborate with the cross-border inventors? And what do the cross-border inventors bring to these incumbent inventors? So I just will show you the graphical, uh, uh, the qualitative evidence, uh, the regression more or less give us the result uh, that, um, that, that I can anticipate. So this is, for example, the productivity level. is the number of patents per inventor uh, done in each year of observation. Uh, split again in black, the treated inventors, the inventors in the treated regions, in red, the inventors in the non-treated regions. And until before the shock, they have the same productivity. After the shock and before the treaty is applied all over Switzerland, the inventors in the treated regions increase their productivity relative to the others. But if I redo this analysis and I consider only the patents that incumbent inventor have done in teams without any cross-border inventors, the difference is not there. Actually, of course, as you can expect, is in favor of those in regions without cross-border inventors and the trend remains parallel. So what is the message? Combat inventors increase their productivity and they increase their productivity only if they manage to take in their uh, labs, uh, some cross-border inventors. Note that many incumbent inventors are senior people because they were already active before the shock. So they may be the chief of the team, the chief of the R&D lab. So they profit from, yes, please. Uh, I, uh, sorry, for Francesca, I had a problem. I'm not used to, yeah. to use a Zoom. Uh, a question, you use the word productivity, yeah. which uh, uh, in this case, you look at the output, no? you don't control for any input. So you have more people working there. 
you have more output, uh, in which sense you increase your productivity? No, because this is this is the number of patents per person. So this graph is uh, the number of patents by Francesco Lissoni, by Carmine Ornaghi each year. So it's it's at the individual level, this analysis. Okay, so this partially addresses my question, but in reality, you know only, let's say, the input because they are on the output. That is, you don't know how many people actually are working in those companies because you only know the number of inventors, not actually the input they are putting in the in that output production function. And no, okay, I don't know. First, I know all the people one by one. I know with Francesco Lissoni, I know with Carmen Ornaghi, so I, I, know, I know each of them. Uh, so in, um, in, in this statistical graph, this is, you're right. I just, I just showing you the, the evidence in the regression, I have a fixed effect for all the, also the company. So I have the fixed effect of the company that uh, can take into account the different amount of resources the company have, uh, including the size of the company, presuming that the size doesn't explode uh, or <laughs> collapse uh, in the, in the, in the amount of time I have. And the results go in the direction I'm showing to you. I'm just saving time by showing you the the, the descriptive statistics uh, rather than the results. Okay. So even yeah. if I control for fixed effect of the firm, I still have um, I still have uh, the evidence for you know, on my side. Okay. Um, so, um, Francesco, just to let you know that you have like six minutes. Okay, I finished. I finished. Uh, the, the other point I wanted to is to, to say is uh, division of labor. This also may go in the direction of maybe of Carmine. What happens is that if I consider the incumbent inventors in the treated and the non-treated regions, not only those in the treated regions are more productive the moment they have uh, CBI cross-border in the team, but if I look at the inventors with whom they do patents, they have more choice. So they have more distinct inventors. So you, Carmine, are uh, in the non-treated regions, you patent only with Jackin. I am in the treated region, I patent with Valentina, Joan, uh, and many other people uh, here in the room. So Grace, uh, Corrado, Becky. So the number of distinct inventors with whom I can work is higher, which uh, tells me that in terms of input, I have more choice. I can choose the best partner for my team. And the last is distinct knowledge asset. Patents, for those who don't know, have citations inside. And the citations, to make a long story short, can be used as a measure of the depth that uh, that invention has to previous knowledge. There may be patents, it may be publications, done by some who preceded me. We look at the geographical location of these knowledge resources exploited by the patent. And we find that uh, with pat by patents that include uh, foreign inventors, the cross-border inventors, uh, they disproportionately cite foreign literature. So it means that uh, something that these cross-border inventors bring uh, is some skills, uh, some pieces of knowledge uh, that uh, are pretty distinctive. They, it, they come from the countries of origin. However, they do not be lovers because when we see they are native co-inventors doing patent with somebody else. They don't use the knowledge of the cross-border invent. Uh, finish at a free movement uh, increase with patenting uh, in um, uh, through inventors immigration. We don't find displacement of natives. We don't find brain brain. We think that immigrant inventors are the net addition to the human capital of both the home and the host country. It's very important to stress immigrant inventors are people in the early career stages. We don't find the big knowledge transfer, though we find the traces of uh, in-demand skills. They provide in-demand skills and some dis they use some distinctive knowledge asset. Policy relevance, of course. Uh, free movement is a pillar of the European uh, uh, economic area. In Switzerland, is under threat. It has been abolished with referendum already once, reinstated. It has been abolished in Brexit, uh, in, in UK with Brexit. It's uh, giving it up, maybe costly in terms of innovation terms. And the, some, in, in particular, some countries in Europe are like Switzerland, they are Belgium, they are Netherlands, Denmark. They are highly small R&D intensive uh, regions that fish a lot from the uh, movement of people. For them, uh, this is a key resource for innovation. Okay, that's a lot. <laughs>